it's just been a few weeks since we commemorated 9-11 um, and the horrors of that day, the attacks on New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania. Um, my parents would talk about Pearl Harbor, Kennedy assassination, seared into the consciousness of the American landscape. It was a day of shock and horror and loss, but something was supposed to come out of the ashes of the Twin Towers and the smoldering Pentagon. Our nation came together, we were going to, the realization we were going to make America safer. We need to change the way we protected ourselves to face the new challenges, the new threats of the 21st century. In my mind, and being in D.C. 18 months, we've lost sight of that. Rather than recalibrating our security strategy to fight the non-state actors who attacked us, we continue to spend and spend to combat the enemy of a different era. We can no longer continue to spend real money based solely on those theoretical threats. In the nine years since these attacks, this country has been in a perpetual state of war, militarily, politically, and economically. We have spent over a trillion dollars trying to buy Middle East security at a gunpoint. That is a huge investment, but any economist will tell you you can't make decisions based on sunk cost. It is time to step back to evaluate our global needs and build the military to match those needs as if we were starting from scratch. The stakes. Um, we've got to get this right. I had to add this uh, after the news that came out just yesterday that the FBI made an arrest of a person from my district planting a would-be bomb outside Sluggers at Clark and Eddy. You want to talk about the issue being close to home? That is exactly one block from where my wife and kids uh, sleep at night. So in the end, the bottom line is we need to decide if we really can afford to do things we, the way we are doing, if we can really afford to be the world's police. We need to see if military might really ends terrorism. And we need to embrace a foreign policy rooted in diplomacy and restraint. It is an uncertain world. While Congress was literally fighting over missile defense, our enemies attacked, the, attacked us with box cutters. We do face many real and potential threats. Non-state actors like Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah, rogue states like Iran, possibly the greatest threat we face, and potential rivals like China and Russia. The best we can do is to prepare based strictly on the realistic assessment of these threats to our national security not on the need to preserve jobs, bases, or contracts. Literally, folks, when I was there asking about the F-22 vote on the floor, and I went to the Blue Dogs, arguably the fiscal side of the Democratic Party, why they were joining with the Republicans to preserve the F-22 that Bob Gates said we don't need, and we don't want, and we can't afford, they told me it's because it's built in 200 congressional districts. But if it's just about job creation, we would be far, far better off rebuilding our transit system, our schools, our overpasses, our bridges that are probably right here near you. If we do that, we can protect our interests with a military suitably scaled, one that capably protects us without costing a dime more than is necessary. To do otherwise places us in the danger of, as President Eisenhower put it, destroying from within that which we are trying to defend from without. But after 9-11, we sent thousands of US troops to Afghanistan explicitly to go after Al-Qaeda. But now few Al-Qaeda remain in Afghanistan. CIA Director Leon Panetta said, at most, there are 50 to 100 still there. Al-Qaeda is, is not a state-based adversary, but a global network of extremists who find safe haven in ungoverned spaces around the world, the latest of which we were talking to the leaders of Kenya who told us that they are afraid that they can't protect their borders and that Al-Qaeda will join them. If you follow the logic of our policy the last 10 years, we would send 50 to 100,000 troops there as well. According to a source at the U.S. Defense Agency, we know that South Asia is no longer Al-Qaeda's primary base. They are looking for a hideout in other parts of the world and to continue to expand the organization. Their networks are growing and operate in Yemen, Somalia, 
Uzbekistan, Sub-Saharan Africa, and obviously even right here on our own soil. Terrorists from around the world can communicate and unite through the internet. As Thomas Friedman wrote in the New York Times last year, the most active front in this war against terrorism is not Afghanistan, but the virtual Afghanistan. The loose network of thousands of jihadist websites, mosques, and prayer groups that recruit, inspire, and train young Muslims to kill. End of quote. And yet the U.S. has over 95,000 American troops on the ground in Afghanistan, fighting an enemy that is no longer there. New evidence shows that our presence there is actually fueling the insurgency we are fighting. Congressman John Cherry, the head of the subcommittee I'm a member, doing an extraordinary job, recently discovered that the U.S. military is funding a multi-billion dollar protection racket in Afghanistan. A good portion of the 2.16 billion transportation contract is being paid to corrupt public officials, warlords, and the Taliban to get needed supplies to our troops. So we are paying protection to the insurgency we are fighting. If you were to start over, what would you do? How would you do it? And who would do it? At the local level, it was easy. If you were to start over, would you start with township governments or 748 school districts in Illinois? No. But if you start over today, would you build the military uh, systems that we have in place today? No, because we're not, and you wouldn't do it because you're not challenging today's problems today. But before we examine each expenditure against this question, we have to figure out what we're spending. Believe it or not, the sad truth is that DOD is one of the only federal agencies that cannot pass an independent audit. It cannot account for all its expenditures and assets. Without an audible budget, we have no way of properly analyzing what we are spending. Another serious problem is procurement reform. Procurement costs have increased 110% in real terms since the year 2000. Even if you take out war-related expenditures, peacetime spending on, or R&D, has increased 75%. While Secretary Gates has taken some steps to cut unnecessary purchases, such as the presidential helicopter, F-22, and the alternative engine, F-35 engine, uh, he continues to face opposition from Congress literally at every turn. A few examples. Our Navy. We don't need 20 times more firepower than the nation to, to achieve security. The DDG-1000 Zoom Wall class destroyer, folks. Less agile, more expensive than old destroyers, it's focused on open water instead of the shoreline locations, while many of our threats occur less than three miles from shore. The one common characteristic of all these expenditures is not only their costliness, but they have no useful application in today's world. All expenditures should be measured against the benchmark. Will it keep America safer? And if the answer is no, it should be rejected. With finite resources must come choices. The real ramification of overspending on defense is not simply that we have too many unnecessary ships, aircrafts, or missiles, but they are diverting too many resources to defense that we are neglecting other domestic investments such as healthcare, education, infrastructure to remain a superpower. As Benjamin Fredo of the Cato Institute said, we spend too much because we choose too little. The obstacles to implementing cultural changes of this magnitude are immense, but the stakes are equally great. America, with its multitude of resources and role as a beacon of liberty, we call that to defend its interest long after Al-Qaeda is vanquished. I ask only that our resources be deployed as a last resort and with the tools they need to do the job. Sixty years ago, President Eisenhower warned of humanity hanging from a cross of iron, and yet we are here today, seemingly no wiser and even more vulnerable to such a fate. Even as the Secretary of Defense, not to mention countless defense and budget experts, have pleaded with Congress to make changes. We remain committed to spending on defense systems that go far beyond what is needed to keep us safe. But there is good news. As I've outlined this morning, we can spend less and be safer. By divesting from billion dollar weapon systems that can't fight non-state actors, bolstering intelligence efforts, and renewing our focus on effective homeland security, 
we can recalibrate our power without lessening it. It's time for Washington to brace itself for a conversation that is long overdue. We owe it to the thousands of soldiers who have made the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you for being here this morning, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have.